right, welcome to join me now in this time of meditation. Just reflecting for many of us here now, how many times we've gathered and we've, we've sat together and generated this uh, energy and heart and dedication of meditation together. Also, I know our Aranya Bodhi Hermitage is on together, so sharing their practice and the goodness of their retreat time there, and the great energy of the forest here from our monastery, that depth of stillness, and tranquility, and heart of dedication generated by the dedicated practice of all here sharing that with you and you likewise also sharing your presence your heart of dedication the goodness of your practice during this time
as we're nearing the end of our meditation time together, I'd like to invite you to allow your heart to rest in gladness. Contemplating what has been well done Whether one thing, very small but bright, many things, the accumulation of your sincere and dedicated efforts. Contemplate the benefit that you've experienced. the good that you've seen for others, felt for them, that they've experienced. You've seen or felt or heard. And bring that gladness into the heart. Let the heart Resonate with that gladness. Joy, appreciation. Notice however it feels. And allow that resonance to spread in your body through your body. All the cells are able to join in that resonance together. The gladness and goodness of what's been well done. The benefits that we have. That we are bearers of and holders of now. We so wish that that may not be lost. Not through clinging or grasping, trying to hold on but just allowing our hearts to be a good and welcoming place for such virtue, such blessings, such benefit. Seen in oneself, seen and known in oneself and others. And our bodies to be a place, our feelings, our minds to be a place where such can grow and dwell, not be diminished, allowed to flourish in gladness, able to be shared and spread. Like when we say sadhu, 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 with all sincerity, well done, well done, well done, bravo, good on you, congratulations, awesome, awesome, well done. And allow it to go deep, like a plant getting deeply watered. And 
in our hearts, bodies, feelings, mind. We can feed on many things. This is wholesome nutriment, nourishment for the heart, nourishment for living well. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang tamang sankang. Namasami. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. There are those with little dust in their eyes. Pray, share the Dhamma for them. So I'm going to offer another chant in Pali and also in English. I'm going to chant it through one time in Pali and English, and then the second time, you're welcome to join in chanting together if you'd like. I think our tech support, uh, all blessings upon her for all her efforts during this whole time, through thick and thin, uh, will be sharing the text with you. She's going to put the text in the chat, <laughs> so you can see it there, if you'd like to see it. Okay, that was a thumbs up. Te na pamajeyang tamang sucharitang chare 
Dhammachari Sukhang Seti Asming Loke Param Hichaham Dhammachari Sucharitang Natang Tucharitang Chari Dhammachari Chari Sukang Seti Asming Loke Paramhecha. Rise up, do not be heedless. In the Dhamma faring, fare ye well. Happy are those who fare in Dhamma, in this world and beyond. Well faring are those who fare in Dhamma. Ill faring, those who fare not well. Happy are those who fare in Dhamma, in this world and beyond. Utitite napamajeyam tamang sucharitang chare tamajari. Sukang seti asming loke paramijam tamman chare sucharitang natang ducharitang chare tamma chari sukang seti Asming loke paramhecha. Rise up, do not be heedless. In the Dhamma faring, fare ye well. Happy are those who fare in Dhamma, in this world and beyond. Well faring are those who fare in Dhamma. Ill faring, those who fare not well. Happy are those who fare in Dhamma in this world and beyond. So these are the words um, of the Buddha, passed on as the Buddha's words upon his return to Kapilohastu or Kapilohatu in Pali, his hometown, uh, upon hearing which uh, his foster mother who nursed him and cared for him and raised him uh, and we think loved him very much uh, upon seeing him returning home after uh, years away of hard striving and then news of awakening coming from far away through the messengers and then of others awakening as well. Uh, Dhamma students, disciples, spreading uh, around the, the land, more and more people also joining the Sangha as the Buddha's students. And then, um, you know, um, back in his hometown, then actually his parents, uh, foster mother and father and family and others, uh, actually wished to see him again. So there were messengers who were sent according to the story to ask him to come and return. Uh, and according, according to the tale, this charming tale, uh, then the messengers were sent in groups and then they didn't come back. <laughs> so they were supposed to go and then bring him, <laughs> invite him and then escort him back. But they came and they saw the Buddha and the Sangha and then group after group, they decided to join the Sangha and ordain. <laughs> and they said, no, I'm not going back to that, <laughs> that life again. So uh, several groups of messengers successively got sent and then didn't return. And then other word then filtered back that they had, had joined the Sangha. <laughs> um, but finally, uh, then the Buddha decided that it was the right time uh, to set out on foot uh, with a community of monks, the uh, Bhikkhu Sangha, and return to his hometown of uh, Kapilavastu. 
So you might think just everything was all great and roses and raining flowers and, and, and all of that, but uh, apparently there were, there were some issues initially, like the elder Shakyans felt because the Buddha was young, uh, that they, uh, that like, because they were elders, they should be respected and they shouldn't, they shouldn't bow or they shouldn't, shouldn't show deference or, or respect to him. Uh, so he's said to have taken some of the, I don't know, the, uh, tricks, <laughs> not tricks, not really, but spiritual powers, use some spiritual powers then, uh, to make them understand, uh, help them to understand and get through their pride. And, um, you know, this is the thing for, uh, like parents to bow to their children would seem to be something like upside down according to these old customs, right? The parents or the grandparents, the, the children should bow and should touch the feet of the parents and grandparents, not vice versa. Um, but when uh, one becomes an awakened one, uh, then that turns the things upside down, right? in the Buddha's teaching then for those who have that sense of value, right? But there were those who were clinging to these other values. And so then it's different senses of values colliding. You may, maybe they had their own gurus already, their own priests and their own, their own way and that kind of thing. And they, they didn't understand necessarily all or believe that the Buddha was a uh, Buddha or awakened one. He was the prince who ran away from home and uh, shirked his responsibility uh, and then, you know, didn't, didn't come back for years and years uh, to someone who may have been like that. Yeah. Uh, but according to his uh, presence, then uh, the, the way that he showed up, according to the stories, then um, many of them, their sense of value changed and their, it's like maybe a deeper human value where uh, what has been realized and what can be shared is even more important than a hierarchy of, of age or class or caste. Um, because it's something at the, like, at the very depths of our human hearts and come into us all. And that's what the Buddha felt he had realized. And that's where he was coming from and what he was interested in sharing, not only rites and rituals and uh, the form of traditions that had been passed down, but the, the heart. So then we have the Buddha and his, uh, uh, you could say perhaps uh, triumphant, I don't know, triumphal uh, entry then into Kapilavastu, Kapilavastu, then not to return to become the secular king, um, but people said then and become a Dhammaraja. Uh, which means anyway, like uh, a, a leader, a great, great leader in the Dhamma or in the, in the Dharma. Uh, so for the Buddha in this case, recognizing again that today is also Palm Sunday. For Jesus in his story, we know that there were only a few days left before his crucifixion. And there wasn't a lot of time uh, between that, that entry into the city uh, and uh, then the, the time that he wasn't going to be teaching in person anymore in the same kind of way. Who knows what actually happened, but according to the stories as they're passed down, but for the Buddha, our understanding is that he was then able to teach successfully for you know, four more decades. So that's a lot more, 84,000 Dhamma Kantas uh, and divisions of the teaching and whole uh, Tipitaka, uh, Tripitaka, uh, all the many uh, Dhamma uh, teachings and higher Dhamma teachings and Vinaya teachings and all of that. 
so uh, this full moon then anniversary of the Buddha's return, these verses that I was just reciting, uh, through hearing these verses in a way that I have to imagine must have been said so sincerely and compellingly with such gravitas in presence. I tried to imagine how the Buddha would have said this to his own family, to his father and, uh, and, and to his mother. I mean, the mother who raised him, Utitite, Napamajaya, rise up, do not be heedless. Tamang Sucharitang Chare, in the Dhamma faring, fare ye well. Dhamma Chari Sukang Seti, happy are those who fare in Dhamma, Asming Loke Paramhicha, in this world and beyond. Well faring are those who fare in Dhamma ill-faring those who fare not well. Happy are those who fare in Dhamma in this world and beyond. So how compelling uh, to have one who one has known through so many things growing up and then to have them come back, uh, we think, so changed and to say such words I imagine, you know, in a way it just seems like nice poetry, but in another way it seems extremely forthright and direct and compelling. So due to the, uh, the gravitas of that meeting and uh, what was said, then um, both the Buddha's uh, mother, uh, means foster mother who raised him, Mahapajapati Gotami, also his father, Sudhodhana, uh, realized stream entry, and then also his wife, Bimba Yasodhara, mother of Rahula, Rahula Mata, uh, then uh, also uh, undertook the refuges and precepts, and also encouraged their son, Rahula, uh, some people say born on the eclipse, the eclipse is Rahula, uh, Rahul, uh, then she told her, their son, Rahula, to ask the Buddha for his inheritance, which he then did. He went to him, pointed out who is his father, who he hadn't known and then asked for his inheritance. And so this is also then the time that uh, Rahula then received the haircut, shaving, monastic robe, and alms ball as his inheritance uh, from his father. And then also the Buddha asked his brother to carry his ball. <laughs> and then also his brother Nanda, <laughs> Then also, even though he was scheduled to get married at that time, <laughs> then his brother Nanda then also ended up going forth uh, into monastic life. So some people find this story quite, quite strange because they say, okay, this is all you go into monastic life and it's leaving home and going forth and leaving the world. You've left the world behind and what's this coming back and you bring your whole family into monastic life. <laughs> so what's that? Is in Buddhism a little odd in this regard? How can you say you're leaving the family if you're bringing your whole family <laughs> into the sankha, uh, into the into the monastic life. Um, but actually, there's an ancient heritage uh, of this, even predating the Buddha, even the Jain order. Also, you know, prior to the Buddha, then uh, close uh, relatives of the uh, then current leader of the Jain uh, community, then the uh, Nikanta Nata Buddha. Uh, then uh, also known as Mahavira, but the Buddha was also known as Mahavira, it means great hero. Uh, so uh, all, all, all already had family members in his monastic community as well. Uh, and this is something that I've seen in person, living in Buddhist monastic life, especially in my time in Asia. That was initially a kind of a surprise for me because 
Although I didn't grow up Christian or with Christian monasticism, there was something in the culture that I had got the idea, like in monastic life, you have to be so so separate from your family, something I, I mean, like the whole, the, the words that we use, like leaving the world and uh, all of that. And then I saw in monastic life, then there were the, the, there was association still with relatives in Dhamma, not just like playing around or, you know, necessarily doing householder things, but um, really this very sincere sharing. And I know a number of those who I consider to be great teachers, then also when their family members saw what happened to them it means how they developed because they knew them for a long time and when they saw their growth and their change in this path of practice then sometimes with family karma the people can be like most obstinate like some of the buddhist relatives and it's like just because of having this kind of fixed idea in the mind it can like other people can see the change, but they're like, you know, just so fixed, you know, the blinders on and the view about who that person is and what they are and what they should be doing and, and, and all these kinds of things that they, they can't see uh, due to that karma. But many times over time they can. And then this is something that can be really deeply, profoundly transformative because it's one thing to think about a Buddha far away who is not my relative and this happened to them or some other masters who are like a different race or nationality. You know, I mean, different family, different clan, right? Uh, and, you know, far away in some other country who become like sages and saints and this kind of thing. But when you see someone who you closely identify with, who is like you think are, is your blood, your kith and kin, like their body you think is made out of the same stuff as your body and you have shared so many experiences and learning and all these things in heart and mind. And then that, that sense of identity, sometimes the power of it, is that that makes it seem like if that relative of mine can do this, why can't I? I can also. And then that provides the link that opens up the way, that opens up the path. So even when we share about these great Sangha members, when we see something or hear something or read something that we deeply identify with in our hearts, then that bridge gets opened up and that connection is there because of our sense of identity. And then we also feel that we ourselves can also do likewise. And that opens up the path, it opens up the way. So, you know, I, I heard a story about one old master in Thailand, uh, in the Thai forest tradition. And then uh, one of his relatives was planning to get married, kind of like the Buddhist story and his brother Nanda, in this case, a little bit similar because, but much more recent, uh, just this last generation. Uh, so then uh, he was asked to give a blessing which is not so uncommon that a monastic would be asked to give a blessing. I've been asked to give a blessing and Dhamma talk also, you know, for my sister's wedding. Yeah? Uh, and so then he, he asked, do you really, do you really want me to do this? I said, yes, we really do. <laughs> All right, at your own risk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Maybe you want to ask someone else. <laughs> no, we really want you to. <laughs> we admire you. We appreciate you. We, re we revere you. We appreciate your teaching. We want your blessing and your Dhamma teaching on this you know, occasion for us. And so then they were going to like go as part of their wedding and then affirm their refuges and precepts and make an offering and then like receive a blessing and hear a Dhamma talk, right? 
as as part of their day and you know offer something to the sangha and all of that and it happens a lot in buddhist uh, asian culture now in theravada culture south and southeast asian buddhist culture particularly uh not so uncommon so <laughs> they did they requested the refuges and precepts and then they made an offering and then he starts to speak about the dhamma to them <laughs> but you know what happened you can guess what happened can't you anyway not only one of them the husband to be the groom but also the wife to be the bride <laughs> Both by the end of the day had entered monastic life. <laughs> what kind of Dhamma talk was that? <laughs> People said, and then uh, the Ajahn, Kruba Ajahn, and he said, they asked for it. <laughs> right? They really did. I warned them. <laughs> um, anyway not actually unfamily friendly <laughs> we don't take vows that we'll never speak to our family members again and there's a recognition from the buddha's lifetime how powerful these connections can be and even those who became like leaders of the buddhist sangha who were not his blood relatives or like close kin in the final life according to them they had been blood relatives many times in past lives even as i said previously for mahapajapati gotami terry on the anniversary of her parinibbana her verses saying that she'd been like mother father sister brother uncle grand grandfather you know so many different uh in so many different roles together so like upalawana Terry, the Buddha spoke of her as his daughter. She spoke of herself as the Buddha's daughter. Uh, and yet, according to the Jatakas, then that was the, the previous life, Vaisantara Jataka, that the, uh, the Buddha uh, in his last life as a Bodhisattva that she was his daughter. So both of them become, having become arahantas, then that was clear to them. Uh, these, as part of the three knowledges, uh, trivija or tevija, uh, that uh, were realized um, by them, that include, included their own past lives and also the relationships with uh, so many others. So, you know, this is one of the things that we wonder when we don't know, right? How did I come to be with these people? <laughs> what kind of karma must I have with them? You just guess but don't know, right? Or sometimes it can even be like so painful and so, so baffling. Or sometimes we can like get a heart sense of it very, very deeply and very, very clearly. Yeah? I've even heard from people who it's like their mother, great what grandmother or even great grandmother or something had passed away they had a special relationship and then when they themselves had a child then it's like something about that child and they well grandma has come back and is here with me but now is this child and this child is like such a such a wise one somehow <laughs> you know older than their years they say but normally by five they start to become more normal again they forget everything uh anyhow so uh very much fr family friendly uh in these regards family friends uh and uh so we speak about the uh the the power then of seeing someone who we know very closely and are identified with waking up and then living as an enlightened being and even before that just like really fully living one's heart heart's dedication is something that's powerful in this world for those who are able to see it in whatever form the person is in but if people are attuned and sensitive if someone is doing that 
it's really such a beautiful and excellent thing in the world and has the power to inspire others to do so as well. Why not? If they can do it, if they can live their heart's meaning and truth and can live their, their deepest heart's intentions so fully to at least to apply themselves to them with all sincerity rather than drugging themselves and numbing themselves and pittering the hours away watching this and watching that or driving here and there while listening to the news and oh, the world is going to hell and our life is like <laughs> all of this, this, that and the other thing and all just this, you know, stuff as Ajahn Brahm liked to say, who ordered this truckload of dung, right? <laughs> we say this kind of thing, and then, the, and my life is a truck driver. <laughs> so, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Yeah. So this is, this is the, the power of the, the Sankha which does not cast out family and, and friends and honors the deep relationships that we may have had with one another. Uh, you know, this country, that country, this lifetime, that lifetime, this, this gender or form or role or relationship or the other, but like deeply honoring and respectful of that and the unfolding of our path over time. Oh, in the Dhamma faring, fare you well. Um, so, per our past pattern, I'd like to now pause and have a little bit of a, just a look back on this last fortnight uh, of our, uh, our practice together, um, uh, winter rainy season retreat, and Ayakema's teachings. I hope those of you who participated with Lee Brisington uh, two weeks ago during my silent secluded retreat time, I hope, I hope that you had a good uh, gathering with him. Uh, for all of us following Ayakema's teachings, then we finished with the Potapada Sutta. And having taken a deep dive into the, the jhanas, going through all of them, completing the Potapada Sutta in these final two weeks of our retreat time. Then we had teachings from Ayakema uh, on the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the, the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. So I found these teachings really, well, all of Ayakema's teachings and this really wonderful and powerful. And her and Dhamma talk on where do we go from here in spiritual practice and life, these talks. Also, you know, I've heard quite a lot of retreat ending talks somehow in my lifetime. And I, I kind of thought maybe I, I don't even want to listen to these because you know, uh, I just heard so many and they tend to be quite similar in some ways. And uh, uh, also I'm, I'm not ready to stop the practice <laughs> and be going on to do something else. Um, but I, I listened to them and I also found them so compelling and excellent. Wow, what a great teacher. How fortunate we were to have this time and this Dhamma sharing. Uh, I mean, really blessings. Uh, it seems so common to have video teachings now, but the time that these teachings were coming from, we, we had them in video mostly, but then also even to have the audio and video wasn't being done so much at that time, but people recognized, wow, we've got a live one here. This is a, this is a teacher. And so I'm so glad uh, even so many years ago that they recorded it and still all so applicable. The trends that she saw in our society at that time, then I just realized, oh, and how, how much the more so. She really, really pegged it in terms of 
where we were going with with those trends and also the Dhamma considerations uh, in relationship to those trends are not irrelevant at our time now. So um, in the, uh, one of these final teachings, then I came was talking about harmonizing. For those of you who have followed them, I don't know if you notice this, but this is one of the things that I was particularly interested in, in her teaching, even from before we really started, because there aren't so many jhana teachers, jhana teachers in Theravada Buddhism who are teaching publicly or, you know, outside just the uh, small confines of the monastic community. And Ayakema was certainly known as a jhana teacher. Then um, I found uh, Ayakema's jhana teachings during this time. I mean, she was speaking based on the sutta, largely, so much. These, these teachings just came uh, from the suttas, but then also obviously sharing from her experience uh, working together with the uh, jhana practicing uh, people over many years time. It's something that I've noticed about those practicing with jhana with some other teachers is sometimes becoming like hypersensitive, controlling, really having such strong requirements of the environment or of the other people and how the other people are and it's like very can be very hard to live up to those like things have to be absolutely silent and you know so like calm and still and tranquil and can't have anything going on and there can't be dogs barking and um these these kinds of things like this uh, and then i had noticed in past for those who have done the retreats with ayakema's teaching whether in her lifetime or even through these video recordings that the people often afterwards seem to be so much better harmonized. Their rough edges in relationship and their way of perceiving things and responding or reacting to things and all that that are normal in people's character and personality. And like you get to know people, you get to know where their rough edges are most of the time, right? But then just noticing, like, after having that retreat time, then just how attenuated uh, those things were. And like, just how much more easeful and fluent and comfortable and non-reactive and, like, their hearts seem to be. And rather than being, like, walking rose bushes with thorns, they became like the dethorned kind of rose bushes that are in, like just soft, like soft petals and not going to snag on anything and going around with this lovely fragrance sometimes even from their meditation, right? And wow, so I was really interested in like then what's what's the difference in the teachings and practice that some people are becoming kind of more hypersensitive and seem to be like catching on things much more easily and having you know, more friction and kind of dis disharmony in a way. And, and others like with Ayakema's teaching are like, you know, just getting so much more easeful and comfortable and fluent and, you know, non-afflictive non and non-reacting. And in theory, of course, with the suppression or especially with the uprooting of the five hindrances then you know when the, the five hindrances are are suppressed even then the the tendency of the mind to be like catching on things and needing things and you know rubbing up against things and to, to be like either too you know too too dull or to be too activated or all of that those things become absent 
greatly attenuated or, or absent. And so that's like so, so wonderful and lovely. But then how is it that this is like then being carried into the people's lives and, and relationships, not just, you know, just on the cushion uh, for that period of time. And I saw in this teaching uh, really how Ayakema very specifically directed people to harmony and to harmonization. So it's not just something that just happened to come out of this way of practice and this teaching, but there was very specific direction that was given. And she's such a powerful speaker. And, you know, the way that she was talking about uh, harmony and like something that we can do for the world. I mean, for ourselves and also that as Buddhists and as you know, spiritual people, as meditators, as practitioners, this is something that you can do, that you can, can offer for the world. I don't even know how to say it in the kind of compelling and powerful way that she said it. If you didn't listen to these talks yet, please, if you have a chance, please do. Um, but then then I almost feel, I feel kind of like Hideo Tapa in myself because I, I almost feel like ashamed if I don't try to do that. <laughs> I don't know that she was trying to make us feel ashamed if we don't do it, but maybe. <laughs> Uh, but like, if I, if I just go back to my regular conflictive and afflictive ways of seeing and perceiving and relating and, and doing all these things, and I, I feel ashamed having heard her, her say that. I've got to, got to try better than that as a, as a Buddhist and as a meditator. And, you know, she gave so much teaching and Dhamma and methodology and means to be able to, to do so. I, I need to make effort with that. I need to practice and train myself with that. So I so much appreciate that support. Some people say that the Americans just need to be coddled in everything and just have everything like ever so nice and gentle and you can't can't talk tough you can't give the tough love dhamma talk to to the americans as you can to the asians sometimes people say they they say these kinds of things but i came i felt her tough love <laughs> quite a lot maybe that time was still tough love was still still fashionable how to take that in really as a gift of such kindness and generosity and then use it in the way that it's meant as a support for our strengthening, for our encouragement, for our, our integrity. And, you know, to have the, the umph, the wherewithal to be able to then do what's been, what's been, you know, what the, that teaching that's been shared and to really put it into practice. And so the harmony, that harmony teaching, oh, so I just wanted to mention that because it was, um, it was such a, a kind of a, a profound part of this last, the teaching in this, these last two weeks here within spiritual practice in life and where do we go from here together with the Buddha's words on loving kindness. So then uh, also uh, Lee Brasington's Dhamma sharing. Uh, I just want to appreciate Lee so much. You had just one time with him, perhaps, and uh, we, in the monastic community, we had several times collectively via Zoom uh, to have the like introduction and uh, then also the interviews time together, uh, plus this offering for our whole greater community. Uh, I just want to greatly appreciate him, uh, not only for taking Ayakema's teaching to heart and then giving so much of his life to sharing that with others for so many years, uh, since then, and also preserving these videos 
uh, teachings and, and sharing them with us, but really for just beautiful, ready and quick generosity and being unfailing in kindness and support uh, in the Dhamma. So, I mean, when we see these kinds of behaviors, these kinds of heart qualities, we recognize that it's something of deep common value in human life, in deep, deep value and worth um, coming from this path of practice. So I understand that Lee spoke with you about dependent origination. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, mention that uh, Aya Sopana here with me now, uh, Venerable Sopana Terry, uh, our Dhammadrini Vice Abbess, also a long time uh, Dhamma and meditation teacher, uh, that she will be offering the transformation retreat uh, on the topic of dependent origination uh, coming up starting. Uh, I can you tell us about that? I'd like to invite and welcome anyone who would like to join. This was originally planned by the Southern Dharma Retreat Center. Uh, we, it has now become liberated to become a Dana-based retreat and Damadrini Monastery will be hosting it. So all those friends who said that they'd really like to join and really wished it would be a Dana-based retreat, your wish has come true. Uh, I please go ahead and you can give us a very brief introduction and welcome. I, can you turn on your video? and unmute. Okay. Uh, dear friends, um, this retreat is the result of a wonderful uh, dialogue that we had among our small group during the previous Vasa. And then I took um, those conversations and had the chance to develop them uh, further um, doing um, a more, more study and uh, reflection and sutta study during uh, during this winter retreat in order to uh, produce something. Uh, I was directing it towards uh, the people in the south, southern United States who don't get so much Dhamma and who get so much um, benefit and gain from just hearing the basic true teachings of the Buddha. Uh, we know how beneficial the Dhamma is just just as it was taught. And now we um, have a chance now to bring it uh, uh, back here to um, the wider group here in, here in California. And so uh, you may come and participate in the entire, it's really four full days of the retreat. Um, and um, if you're not able to sit the entire retreat, you may come in for Dhamma Talks, which is on our website. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I also, I, I want to share appreciation uh, with, uh, again, with Aya Suchita, uh, who offered, uh, how many times I, so many times offered the refuges and precepts, I think four out of the uh, six times. And with uh, Aya Sudama, uh, also for being our guest teacher, uh, offering the refuges and precepts and um, Dhamma reflections related uh, to them uh, twice during this program. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation also to tech support. <laughs> uh, so uh, much appreciation actually to everyone who has participated together and also everyone who has offered uh, so much support during these three months time, whether moral support or the support of practicing together or material support, contributing to our food, our lodgings, our medicines, um, our, our warm wear, uh, winter, winter robes. 
uh, all, all of these things. And now we will have some final time uh, for uh, any, any final questions or anything that you would like to share. Uh, and mm, let me see, I'm going to, pardon me for a moment. Uh -huh. I'm just seeing if I can find the chat on here. There we go. So if anyone has uh, any final questions or something they would like to share during this time, then you're welcome to. And uh, then we will have our closing blessings and uh, dedication. Mudita, Mary Doyle, thank you for your kind words. She wrote truly magnificent teachings. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a good Dhamma friend. I'm so glad that you could join in together. Greetings, Shubangi. If you don't have any questions or anything to share, then I, I think our tech support has actually uh, saved, saved questions from previous. You can either, if you'd like to share something, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, or you're welcome to uh, type into the chat. Now, I'm just seeing here that we have, even we have our, our monastic community in uh, Germany and also friends in, uh, maybe in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, friends from far and wide, and I know that some I know that some people actually have gotten stumped by daylight savings time, <laughs> so are only coming on for like one about one hour late. So to everyone for who experienced that, I'm sorry about that. Um, you'll be able to see the first part. <laughs> Uh, later on on the YouTube, if you'd like to. I have a question. I have asked. Yes. Please go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Can you? Are you Can okay you with me? being spotlighted? I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Okay, thank nice you. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, gives my heart gladness. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question or something to comment on. Um, in my immediate world, um, people are pretty nice and kind to me. But lately, you spoke earlier about rough edges and jhana. Um, and I've had like three different experiences, which have been really harsh of people kind of coming at me and feeling like I haven't done anything to engender it. You know, sometimes I do engender a harsh response. And then sometimes it's like, where did this come from? Um, and so I'm trying to sift, you know, what is it that I um, put out kind of in the world that generates, you know, an attack of some, I'm not talking about physical, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when I am not aware that I have done something to create it. Um, so I'm trying just to discern what is, ha is this something I could be doing that I'm unaware of? Maybe that's my question. You know what? Uh, well, it's, uh, I think it's so good and helpful to ask ourselves this question right. and also to recognize in general 
no. that uh, sometimes people are are responding to us or something we have done is activating for them yeah. other times they've got their own thing going on yes. and they're responding to something that somebody else did or something else that happened and they're just in the midst of that thing that they have going on and sometimes even if if you yourself are known as a kind person uh, or a person who's able to like receive things or give care, kindness or compassion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes then, uh, or, or if you're trustworthy, sometimes then people feel able to like come with all their stuff. Uh, and you might not be thinking that you're asking for it or that you're inviting it and you may not wish for that. Right. right. But somehow if you're kind and compassionate and trustworthy, then sometimes people feel like they can, they can, they don't have to hide what's going on for themselves, that they can, mm -hmm. they can show it, they can share it, they can speak uh, how they're feeling about what's going on, and maybe they think that you're, you're not going to punish them or fire them or, or, or kill them uh, right. for, you know, for just expressing what's actually going on for them because they trust in your, in, it might be, you know, I mean, these yeah. situations uh, exist, right? No way to know. Yes. So, well, actually, it's not that there's no way to know. It isn't. Um, we right. may or may not know. But I'll just say that, that all of these things uh, regularly mm -hmm. uh, exist. That is that people, people are triggering each other. Yes, mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happening a lot. And also that people have been triggered by somebody else and something else and they're in their own thing and they have that going on. And then they bring that into the presence of people mm -hmm. who may or may not be able to care for it well. You know, so sometimes, pe as I said, people will do that when they trust someone or then they're, they're confident in their kindness or compassion, or sometimes they're just out of control. Mm -hmm. And when the people are just out of control, that's like when it's really unwise, right? When, when people are behaving in ways that are not so good and it's maybe not necessarily because they feel that person is safe and trustworthy and kind and compassionate. Yeah. It, and it's not always. And then people get into serious, serious problems with that, right? Mm -hmm. So we can see all of these things happening. And when you look outside uh, then, and try to understand what's going on with other people, you can observe all of these patterns. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at what's going on for ourselves in relationship with the people, then yes, as you're doing, we have to ask ourselves, what's going yeah. on here? Mm -hmm. Is this, are, are, they, are they responding to or reacting to something that, yeah, I'm, that I'm doing because it upset them? Mm -hmm. Uh, or are they coming in with their own thing going on uh, and they trust me and feel like I'm going to be able to hear them and hold that and give them the space mm -hmm. and the presence and the love and care that they need. Mm -hmm. And that's, they've come to me because they have that need. Uh, or are they just... <laughs> I don't mean really crazy, but are they just crazy right now, yeah, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and they're just, you know, they, they, they can't tell and they don't care what's going on with me necessarily. And they're just out of control. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. yeah, so to discern what it, it, what it seems like is going on there is, is really important. So not to always think that it's all about us. Mm -hmm. But not to always think that it's all about them or all about uh, all about others either. So this is really just something important for our mindfulness and our care and discernment. And, you know, whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. as much presence and kindness and compassion and appreciation and equanimity that we're able to bring to that is probably going to be helpful. 
whether they're yeah, expecting it or not. It. Yeah, that's the nut of it. <laughs> oh, Thank you. At least it's going to be helpful for us, right? right? As yeah. we've talked about previously. Uh, and also whatever wisdom you can bring, whether, whether it's just wisdom in yourself mm -hmm. in terms of like you're just seeing what's going on and you're just understanding what's going on and then you're just behaving with as much insight and wisdom as you can. I don't mean like trying to give a wisdom talk to them necessarily, mm -hmm. or sometimes really to, to give that talk, mm -hmm. uh, to speak to um, in, in the way that you think may be needed or helpful. And you may be right or wrong about, about what's needed or helpful, right? But this, this is a path of practice. This is a great training. We can also be humble about these things and like recognize, you know, say, you know, this is something that I know and I, I don't know if this would be helpful for you, but if you're interested, uh, I'm, I'm happy to offer this. I don't know if it will help you or not, but you know, if you're, if you're interested, if you're willing, then I can share this with you and you can give it a try or give it a listen or whatever uh, that is. So, so be humble about it uh, and respectful as much as you can. And then kind to ourselves. We are, we are like flowers that are in a growth and blooming process, right? <laughs> uh, and if we're like a beautiful rosebud right now, and then we're like, damn it, Rose, you should be fully blossoming right now. <laughs> this is, I'm, but really, sometimes we expect of ourselves or we expect of others like that, right? But we have our own time. We have our own seasons. We have our own growth trajectory, right? So as much as we can to be compassionate and understanding and appreciative about that. Okay, so I have, uh, I hope that that's helpful. Uh, and I have a, a, a new anonymous question. I don't understand why the Buddha left to pursue illumina illumination, causing suffering to his family, if one of his main teachings is not causing suffering to others. Well, yeah, that's been a big question for a lot of people for a long time. Uh, and uh, I'll just say, um, First, the Buddha spoke about himself before his great awakening as an unenlightened bodhisattva, an unawakened or unenlightened. So that's the way, at least in the Pali text, the early Buddhist teachings, the Buddha talked about himself before his great awakening. I know in some of the Mahayana traditions, then the situation of the bodhisattva uh, bodhisattva can be made like uh, to seem like they're already like super awakened somehow or I mean anyway uh, not that he wasn't a great being uh, before or didn't practice for a long time or that kind of thing but here's something else um, to consider uh, so we don't know if he had his great awakening experience at home would he have left or not I don't know. Uh, some people who have their awakening experiences at home leave and some of them stay. So even if we look at the Buddha's own disciples, then there are those uh, who uh, you know, were so commended by the Buddha and such excellent practitioners uh, who were householders or who were householder renunciates, or there were those who were wanderers who weren't part of the Sangha, and there are members of the Sangha also of those who were like really good with people and those who were just much more solitary recluses. Even they experienced full awakening, it didn't make them a socialite. And it didn't even necessarily make them good at teaching. So those things are all kinds of merit that one does not necessarily need to have to experience full awakening and the end of suffering uh, for oneself. So before entering monastic life, I had entered into medical training 
And you know, in the medical training, then they're really big on certification. And then legally, then they don't want people who haven't had a certain level of training to be prescribing medication. And uh, they want you to have lots and lots of years of uh, rigorous and intensive training and education before you are authorized in an authorized position to be able to uh, help people as a doctor, right? And uh, when I think about the Buddha's situation, um, then also I'm thinking of a comparison here. Because actually, if we wish to offer something to people, to humanity, and we don't yet have the training or the full capability to do so, or we don't have the license to do so, but we wish to offer that, then we need to undertake that training, that education, and um, even potentially to get that license. And that normally involves sacrifice, even among family people. When I was studying medicine, I was a householder at that time. I hadn't entered monastic life yet. It took an inordinate amount of time that I was not able to spend with my family or with my partner. Uh, and, uh, and it meant that so much time for other like relaxing and enjoyable things also that I wasn't able to do them myself because of the amount of time and energy and effort that that took. So that was a big sacrifice for me. And it was a big sacrifice in a way for others that you can say, well, you know, that's just normal <laughs> in life, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes you try to get the agreement of your uh, of your partner for for something or of your family and sometimes people don't think that they need to get the the agreement of their families to do things they think that they have a right of self-determination uh, to study what they are inclined to study to train in what they're inclined to train in and to work in the field or to to offer what they themselves wish to offer so there are really different sensibilities about this. And they're the people who have the sense of their own self-right of determination in these regards, and others who really like wish to have family and and partners and community agreement uh, for for all of these things. If there is such agreement, right, for other people, there were other other partnered people who are in education then uh, in that case, then even though it may be a great sacrifice and there may be quite a lot of suffering involved, and certainly pre-med, oh my goodness, so much suffering, <laughs> tons and tons of suffering, oh, so much dukkha, who would expect uh, that trying to do something to help people would involve so much dukkha, <laughs> oh. um, but it's not the only field that's like that, of course. Um, so, you know, sometimes a group of people are, are in harmony or in, in agreement about it. And sometimes people just feel really strongly that like, this is my life, this is my own life, and I need to do what is most important to me. Uh, and some people will act in ways on their own determination, then that does cause suffering to those around them, even maybe that's not their wish. Maybe th their wish is not to make others suffer by their action. Now, according to the Buddha's teaching, this would be, this would be quite wrong, right? Um, I mean, that is to have an intention to make others suffer, like doing something in order to make others suffer, then this would be considered very bad karma 
even to think something with the intention, intention to make others suffer, to say something with the intention to make others suffer, uh, or to physically act in a way with the intention to make others suffer. Very bad karma. My, I can't say about the Buddha, but my, my understanding from everything that I've seen, heard, read, all of that, what the traditions are passing down, the, the intention was not, it was not with the intention to make others suffer, not with the thought, let me make my father suffer and my mother suffer and my wife and my child suffer and my, all my people suffer and, and for that sake I'm going forth. Not, it's just, it's not, not the way uh, the story is told. So, uh, there, there is that, yes? Even for us in this practice time now, I think uh, it might be, I don't know, uh, for any of us, are there people who wish to be with you during this time or a pet that you haven't let into the room uh, who may be mourning outside because of not being able to, uh, you know, sometimes they're allowed to join our meditation, sometimes not, right? Um, but for parents with children, then um or you know, partners who you know want to be like maybe for, for me at that time then like i wanted to meditate my partner wanted me to watch tv together i didn't want to spend the whole evening watching tv together <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't my value right and then that caused them suffering uh it was it wasn't me trying to cause them suffering but I just did not feel good to have my school and my work and then to just come and be in front of the TV for hours before going to bed. Um, so, uh, I don't know, was it compassionate or uncompassionate of me? I felt it was more compassionate to do what I needed to do myself to be able to unwind and to have balance and to be able to be doing what was you know meaningful to me uh, uh, during during that time and that i was actually worse if i didn't do that and i still think so <laughs> and those around me can also probably tell you the same thing uh, so they're trying to get me to take a day off but there are so many things that need to be done and the people are asking for it right <laughs> like you know they're going to have to sacrifice if i'm going to have that day off but they think i'm going to be better for it which is actually going to be a benefit for them so do you understand what i mean day off we're talking about time apart uh, or time of not being readily available uh, immediately for all the various things that people are wanting and wishing for. And yet in their wisdom, some of them sometimes notice that there's actually real value in that and that it's worth it. If they didn't have that wisdom, they might not think so. So that's, anyway, some thoughts about this, about this topic. Um, response from the person who asked this question. Thank you very much with a smiley face. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've talked long now. Um, if, if you're still here and you still have time, uh, Mudita, Mary, yes, you're welcome to share your experience. Welcome. And then uh, in another minute or two, we'll have our dedication. Greetings. So nice to see you. I hope this time has been good for you too. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it's been wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Something interesting happened this morning. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. I have a neighbor that lives above me. Uh, I was in the middle of meditation and I heard a very hard thump, louder than ever. So I thought, but then I didn't hear, and then I heard some groaning. And I thought, this doesn't sound good. Anyway, contacted other people, took a while. Anyway, they had to break in the door. He had passed away. Oh. Um, want to get an idea, Buddhist-wise, is there something 
that would be good for me to do if if I need to do anything, I don't know, because of this. I lit some incense, I lit a candle, uh, I said some prayers. Uh, is there anything Buddhist-wise that would be, say, prescribed for something like this on how to handle it? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, and, you know, it seems to me like, I know, Buddhist-wise, <laughs> you, you've done this. You've done the things. Uh, I think you know as well as I do uh, about this. But really uh, asking ourselves in our own heart and touching into our intuition and our knowing, each circumstance is unique. You yourself can, can sense, can feel, you know, what might be needed, what might be called for. If we talk about, uh, as we have in past, during this time, the, the Dhamma uh, of, of our hearts or the, the Dhamma that we know, then meeting the Dhamma of the world, the Dhamma of the circumstances, then you know which Dhamma is the matching one, which is, which is the Dhamma door that is being, uh, uh, say, like knocked on right now. Uh, yes, that's the, the right matching dhamma for this very circumstance. I find it enormously valuable and meaningful also in life, moment by moment, uh, in each part of the day, even I'd say like day after day, week after week, in every moment of awareness to think about like which, which Dhamma is the most excellent Dhamma to meet this situation. And then just turning my heart, turning my mind to that over, over and again. And at first there might be nothing, right? It's like there's, there's no response. I'm knocking on that Dhamma door, but there's no answer. <laughs> Uh, but doing that again and again with interest over time. And of course, it's our own heart. So we might be thinking about like knocking and like reaching and trying to grasp something. But again, if we approach it in the opposite way, and that is like uh, being sensitive to our hearts in a way of like allowing them to open and then look in uh, with that opening and then see and know what's there with the heart and mind really to, to see and know and to be responsive in accordance with Dhamma, to be responsive in accordance with what is healthy, helpful, blessed, beneficial, and liberating. What is the kusala, the kusala dhamma? Just with the heart to avoid what's the akusala, the unhealthy, unhelpful, unwholesome, unblessed, unbeneficial, and like just the wish, the intention to like to avoid that, not go there, and then just to open up the door to what is the what is that healthy, blessed, uh, and liberating, helpful dhamma? Uh, and when we do that over and again, it's like the, the kind of intuition or knowing, uh, sensitivity, and even uh, responsive awareness, responsive intuitive awareness or knowing can grow to the point of... Um, like even appearing with some regularity or sometimes even appearing on an ongoing basis for periods of time, sometimes even to the point of it just becoming the, the onward flow, the Dhamma faring, faring well in the Dhamma uh, that seems unbroken and like there's nothing else or if something, some habit gets triggered and you drop out of that for a moment, then it's like, ah, this is really not where I need to be and not where I want to be and not in accordance with my heart and path and you like need to get 
right back in there again uh, as fast as you possibly can as soon as you realize that you've gone awry that some other ego some habits some other conditioning something else has come up and taken over uh, but it, that's you know not where your own heart's abiding in the Dhamma and not just passive abiding but really fluent responsive awareness uh, yeah functional <laughs> fluent responsive awareness so this can be cultivated and developed uh, if there were someone beloved and we wanted to develop a relationship with them, we might try various things over and over and over again to get their attention and then to try to make them like us and to try to make them pay attention to us and become responsive to us and uh, like develop that relationship with them. Uh, if we really loved them, if we really cared, and in terms of our own selves, our own hearts, our path, our path and our relationship with the Dhamma, with that kind of level of love and care and cultivation and dedication that develops this, you say anyway, relationship that is the Dhammacharya, the Dhamma, Dhamma faring, living, living in the Dhamma, or I suspect for Mahapajapati, we can imagine about being a stream enterer for her then plunging into the stream and then just living in the flow of the Dhamma. So um, let me let me stop there for now. It seems a good place for now. And I'd like to then close with um, uh, dedication and blessings, not only for this time, uh, but for all uh, of these past uh, three months six fortnights uh, and all the upositas uh, uh, all of the the practice together and again thinking of thinking of everyone who has been practicing together and everyone who has contributed and supported in so many uh, beautiful and excellent ways to this time and i also want to share a special um, blessing and uh, dedication you know um, say being out of the loop for a while i just learned today about um, what is it like seven mass shootings oh dear even also then with coronavirus and so many people suffering with so many different kinds of difficult things and just you know my heart let our our hearts go out to all of them with love and care and for all the goodness that we have generated it's not going to be decreased at all by sharing it from our hearts with love and kindness and blessings so uh, with special dedication uh, to those in uh, who died in Atlanta, in Boulder, in Virginia Beach, and all those that we don't see and know in so, so many places um, with illness and aging and coronavirus and uh, uh, suffering from many kinds of causes, uh, making our hearts as big and deep and uh, as wide as the world and like bringing all of them and all of that into the goodness of the Dhamma in our, our hearts and bodies and minds and, and sharing the goodness and blessings of the Dhamma uh, with them. So I'd like to invite everyone now, uh, you're welcome to join in our monastic community here is uh, also welcome to join in uh, with me in chanting the verses of sharing and aspiration in English. Now let us chant the verses of sharing and aspiration. 
Through the goodness that arises from our practice, may our spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, our mothers, our fathers, and our relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world. May the highest devas and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, may those who are friendly indifferent or hostile. May all beings receive the blessings of our lives. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless. Through the goodness that arises from our practice and through this act of sharing, may all desires and attachments quickly cease and all harmful states of mind until we realize Nipanam in every kind of birth may we have a bright minds with mindfulness and wisdom austerity and vigor may the forces of delusion not take hold nor weaken our resolve the Buddha is our excellent refuge. Unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is our noble Lord. The Sangha is our supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, May darkness and delusion be dispelled. Arahang Samma Samputo Pakawam Bodhang Pakawantang Abiwa Demi Zawakato Pakawata Tamam Tamang Namasami Supati Pannam Pagawatom Sawaka Sankhom Sankhang Namami Tech support. Can I can we have open mic time? You are welcome and invited if you're still here together. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to. And can we have the spotlight on be able to see our group together? So if you're still here and you'd like to say anything, share blessings, you're welcome to. If it's time for you to go, that is just fine too. So, blessings to everyone. Pavana, do you have anything you'd like to share? I've really had a very good time in the winter retreat. Um, of course, not the jhanas, but the learning itself was very 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 nice and there were many like nuances which she said while sweeping while many different things which were so helpful like i'd never heard before i've uh, only been to vipassana centers but 
you know, the nausea, like things like, uh, which were very, very new and very helpful. And actually, I felt nausea last week and I'm like, Aya Kema says this is good for me. So I, <laughs> so I was equanimous with that. It's been very, very nice. I've had, oh. I've had a very good, very good ah, practice. Too. Ah, too. And I see that our, uh, our Dhamma Jirini Support Foundation President Emeritus, uh, Shari, is here. Shari, you're welcome. Patipada, I'm happy to see you. Also, Thank you. Director Emeritus Shirley uh, Upasamaya is here. Hello, Shari. So nice to see you after a long time. I'm <laughs> glad you could join in together. Thank you for having this. I'm afraid I came in late, but um, I heard some of your teachings this evening and really appreciated hearing them again. No, they no, were... no problem to come on late. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad that it's worked out. Actually, uh, some some of our community members were mentioning that it would be nice to um, like have an opposite program like this on an ongoing basis. And uh, I, I don't know yet how things will look for the Vasa. Who knows, maybe I'll be on sabbatical and uh, a silent secluded retreat for the entire Vasa, who knows. Um, if I'm not, uh, then I feel like I would be uh, happy for myself or another of our Bikuni teachers to offer such a program and who posted a program like this during during the Vasa again. Uh, so I'm I'm myself so happy with how it's come out and uh, glad about that. And of course, traditionally for Buddhism, there's the Uposita program just every single fortnight going on and on as long as the Dhamma wheel turns. What are the options for visiting at this time if we are fully vaccinated? You know what? Uh, I know that some of the other monastic communities have already been fully vaccinated, like Abhayagiri, they've just completed their vaccines for the whole community. For us, today is the last day of our winter retreat, so none of us are vaccinated yet. Um, but already one of us has an appointment for vaccine, and it might be that uh, then in these next couple of weeks, maybe more and more of us will be getting uh, vaccinated as the vaccinations have opened up for aggregate, uh, aggregate living uh, for group uh, homes, which our, our monastery is an aggregate living facility group home. So we'll see. Uh, when uh, we have all gotten vaccinated, then I think it may become more possible once again. We'll, we'll have to check with, you know, our president, uh, current president, Susie, is of course the expert. So we'll want to check in with her and, and hear, gain her best knowledge. It's been such a boon during this time to have her, the support of her specialized knowledge for our community um, and so we don't know yet we haven't talked to her yet we're just just going to be starting to be now coming out of our retreat time tomorrow with we'll be having parita chanting tomorrow uh, and then uh, we'll be learning about what's going on and uh, we'll be able to answer that question more. Thank you for asking. I was actually thinking of perhaps having some kind of um, like community, post-retreat community gathering for the South and Southeast Asian New Year. Uh, maybe small, not, <laughs> not a big event. Uh, but just to be able to uh, share about the retreat time and uh, also our, our plans and our vision for this coming year and give an update uh, on you know, how things are and what, what we'll be doing. So maybe we'll be able to answer your question more then. That would be in two weeks' time. Uh, I think the, the main dates of the... Uh, South and Southeast Asian New Year, Songkran uh, this year, I think, are around the 14th. 
13th, 14th, something between the, the 12th and the 16th anyway, but I think the 13th or 14th is the primary day. So we'll see, that's just an idea that was coming to me today. I was considering about this. So uh, that might be a nice thing to do. Thank you for asking, Shari. And uh, yeah. uh, when, when we're all vaccinated, uh, do you want to come and visit us? The forest hasn't seen you for a while. Oh, I'd love to come to the forest. I was just thinking and the of the monastery too. Yeah, I was just thinking of coming up for, you know, to offer a meal or something just to, I mean, it's been a long time. Um, I wasn't asking for, you know, a big favor. I, I wanted to offer something to you. Oh, and... Sherry, thank you so much. You know, there are people who have been coming to, to offer meals, home-cooked meals and groceries and supplies outside. And we actually hope hope um, over the holiday time, um, people's holiday giving for the Donna Sala project was really wonderful. So it's looking like we might be able to go ahead with that. Um, if not for Vesak, then perhaps by the time we're entering into the Vasa so that we can have a really like nice, nice and commodious uh, out, outdoor open air uh, traditional space uh, for being able to to gather together uh, safely and to make offerings and receive blessings and listen to the Dhamma. So uh, that's something that we're looking at potentially going ahead with this spring. And you know, even even without it, we have the um, space here at the monastery and and Hermitage also outdoors that the friends have been coming to offer very carefully offer the home cooked meals and groceries and supplies and talk to our wonderful Donna coordinator Lal uh, if you'd like to do that or to anyone here at the monastery or hermitage. So that yeah, we would be delighted if you would like to join in that together. There was a, uh, like a, a rotation of friends and families who uh, offered throughout the entire winter retreat. And now from tomorrow is the last day of that. Then we come to the end of that rotation, then it all becomes open. Uh, we don't have the, the people who are pledged to be coming like that. So maybe you could be one of the first. Okay. Well, I, I, I myself am fully vaccinated. So uh -huh. I thought <clears throat> it would be nice to drop by sometime uh, and maybe just make an offering just to, you know, visit <laughs> again. Yes. That's all. yes. Congratulations on getting fully vaccinated. Now we're going to work on our monastic community for that. I don't know how long it will take us, but it seems like the uh, local people, CDC, uh, was saying uh, April uh, 15th. By, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But I guess I, that means that if you're fully, if I'm fully vaccinated, I believe that means that I'm not contagious. So I can't give you the virus. But I still find that I'm wearing a mask just to, just in case. Yes, good. That seems smart. My understanding is um, if a person has received the vaccine, uh, that uh, if they, uh, even if they catch the virus, that they're probably not going to get very sick or die, but that they're still potentially able to transmit it. Uh, so I think we want for our monastic community, I think we probably will check in with Susie uh, and I, I might be wrong about this, so I'll, I'll, I, I want to check in and find out properly. Uh, but I think probably we'll be opening up more when we have our monastic community here, here vaccinated, unless she tells me otherwise. I trust her knowledge about this. Well, I think that's wise. Because mm -hmm. people have all different kinds of ideas floating around. <laughs> I know. I've heard so many people say so many different things. That's one reason why I really appreciate having someone who's a, a bona fide expert as part of our 
part right. of our community. So I actually, I think that was the only reason I mentioned it because I noticed that Susie had said she might be able to come up and visit now that she was uh, fully vaccinated. Uh -huh. But then I thought, oh, well, that means that, you know, some of the rest of us can, but I can understand you're being conservative and being careful. And I think you're right. I think that is what they say is that it's, may be possible they don't know for sure but it might be possible for someone to transmit it mm -hmm. okay well we haven't had our check-in with Susie yet we will be mm -hmm. doing that now that we're emerging from retreat so we'll find out what she says no pressure I was just asking where you were at on it so and if you would like to join among the friends who have come to make the offerings outside then you're very welcome to do that and we're we're wishing to offer even more lovely commodious outdoor space for for our dinosaur outside uh, for for the people whether they're vaccinated or not <laughs> Patipada, I see that you're here and that uh, I think you've been able to join for a lot of this. Meredith, thank you too. Uh, and Karen, blessings of the Triple Gem to you too. Ilana, I'm glad you were able to join. So is there anyone else who would like to say or share anything? And if not, then we'll, we will hear it is nighttime. And I think the full moon must have risen uh, above our monastery and uh, over Sonoma Mountain here. And uh, we, will, we will say good night and uh, uh, go, for our, go for our full moon night meditation. So um, blessings to everyone. May the goodness we have gained not be lost, but come to fruition in the Dhamma. May we fare well in the Dhamma, in the Dhamma, fare you well.